Hey everyone and welcome to the Evangelist Nick Garrett channel. No telling of the 5th or 6th Holy Land Crusade could be complete without giving special treatment to one of its key characters, Frederick II, the Holy Roman Emperor. Sources differ on the role of Frederick II early in the Crusade. Quite simply, he was detained because he was still establishing his own kingdoms, consolidating power, putting down uprisings, and establishing the governmental systems of his various territories. Frederick's life represents the microcosm of complications that stem from the intermixing of church and state, and the fighting between Christian and Muslim. He was born of Constance and Henry VI, the son of Frederick I, Holy Roman Emperor. When a series of unfortunate deaths struck the family, Frederick II's mother adopted him to the Pope, granting full custody to Pope Innocent III. She did this because she thought it would help safeguard young Frederick's land and inheritance. Of particular note, his land in Italy that bordered the Papal States. Frederick grew up in relative obscurity on the island of Sicily, well-educated and protected. One wonders, knowing the full complexity of Pope Innocent III's character, what it was like for him to have the role of a father. Certainly he would have handed the daily care to some such servant. Yet it is clear by the education that the Pope arranged for Frederick that maybe he envisioned his adopted son in a role to lead wisely in a multicultural world governed by a crusading spirit. Undoubtedly, his primary tutors were Greek and Arab, yet his foundation, Germanic. On top of that, Frederick developed a passion for Jerusalem. Rightly so, who else but someone brought up as a product of several competing worldviews would love the city that served as the center for several of those worldviews. Interestingly, it cannot be coincidental that Frederick II's primary tutor ended up being the Pope that served during his lifetime as Holy Roman Emperor. On the other hand, imagine the dueling expectations that must have plagued his life especially as a young man during the time of the Fifth Crusade when temporal and geopolitical concerns beckoned his attentions. All the while, his adopted father, Pope Innocent III, died in 1216 as the planning for the Fifth Crusade unfolded. One struggles to imagine what the legal construct of separating his own power, assets, and lands from the church at the time would have looked like. Still aiming to continue the reforms Innocent had implemented before his death, Pope Honorius III thought it was important to maintain the new authority of the papacy and uphold the threat to excommunicate Frederick because of his refusal to submit to the papal timeline for the crusade. According to many reputable historians, Frederick II was sincerely committed to crusade, but truly important commitments caused him to delay his departure. Frederick's border and complicated dynamics affected relations between he and the Pope. He was also detained by intrigues in his own kingdom. Frederick II, unlike many of his Western European peers, grew up in what may have been the most multicultural environment on the planet. The Normans, great men like Bohemond of Taranto, had taken Sicily, but it retained its Byzantine and Islamic cultural identities as well. It strikes one that perhaps Frederick was more dangerous to the papacy than infidels and enemies of Christ. No doubt multilingual, well aware of custom and culture, Frederick II was in a position unlike any pope or great military crusader had ever been. Frederick was headstrong and sure. Against the papal advice, he married Constance of Aragon, and with 300 men, he rode toward his Germanic capital to consolidate his power and take rule. Five years later, Frederick returned to Italy where the Pope crowned him in the ritual established by their forebears. Frederick's heart's desire was to take Jerusalem. However, in Italy he found, one after the other, nobles and groups rising against him. Each time he wanted to leave for the Holy Land, another event in Sicily detained him. He kept making commitments to go, and in his heart the crusading culture was alive and well, yet Perhaps it was on these home fields where he would learn what it would take to defeat some of the most skilled warriors of his time. Perhaps Pope Innocent III had been directly involved in teaching Frederick. One recalls that Pope Innocent's assets and skills lied in the mastery of canon law and administration. In Frederick, one saw the wisdom of a leader who governed different parts of his territories under entirely different structures, showing the same mastery of skill. His Germanic territories he ran like centralized nation-states, 
but his Sicilian and Neapolitan structures were entirely different, multicultural, cosmopolitan, and seemingly egalitarian. He was really a specimen of his age and perhaps among the more interesting characters through whom to gain insight not only into church history, the establishment of the nation state, but boldly, positive character traits of his adoptive father, Pope Innocent III, whose papacy otherwise is marred by much cruelty. Ironically, for a papacy marred by the pursuit of authoritarian control, his adopted son would be responsible for perhaps etching Christian theism into the secular law more than any predecessor or successor. Frederick II established the foundation on which the Renaissance of several hundred years hence would be built. How much credit can be given to Pope Innocent III for Frederick's upbringing? One must conclude a great deal. If Innocent had have treated Frederick as he did other projects and initiatives before him, he would have simply squashed the secular Holy Roman Emperor as a position and either killed the boy or banished him into obscurity. Instead, Innocent helped plant the seeds in Frederick that would sprout into a new type of leadership in that modern world. Was the ascension of Frederick's tutor to the papacy a result of scheming in high places? Certainly the church would hope there would be a Holy Roman Emperor they could control. Yet, many would see the rise of Honorius III as a positive move that would heal the disconnect and show the two institutions of empire and church how to work together. It is not hard to see why in his late teens and early 20s, competing interests dominated Frederick's attention. His commitment should have placed him with the rest of the Crusader force facing Egypt. Issues in Italy and ironically with his adopted father's successor instead kept him in Europe. Look forward to talking to you next time when we embark into Damia to Egypt for the Fifth Crusade. Talk to you later.